Welcome to Believing the Real, a series of talks on the theology of the real. In this uh, chapter, part five of the series on Believing the Real, Evo Trust, uh, we will continue to discuss uh, the ideas of Jonathan Haidt in his book, uh, The Righteous Mind, and uh, how the six flavors of morality evolved and how, ultimately, destiny trumps biology. Hello, uh, welcome to another episode of uh, Believing the Real, Evotrust. And uh, today we are going, this is the fifth uh, chapter, and we are going to continue uh, our discussion of Jonathan Hyde's um, The Righteous Mind, uh, which we began in the previous episode. Uh, Hyde uh, actually uh, finds the evolutionary basis of morality, and we are using his summary and his insights uh, to illustrate um, the way in which evolution creates a substructure of biology that is in fact pre-wired, as we said, uh, for uh, what we as uh, choosing uh, free, uh, willing individuals uh, will do with our lives. It's like uh, this is the playing field, the level playing field or the unlevel playing field that we begin with. So uh, his insights will show us where uh, biology is in the greatest conflict with destiny. As uh, we already uh, spoke, let me change the... Um, wait, not this one. Uh, here we are. Okay. So, um, as, uh, as we said before, um, progress and perfection is the way uh, that the universe is structured, and we are the part of divinity that is forever developing. So, uh, we are constantly um, expanding the real, which is the actual presence of the divine. Uh, the cosmos is the presence of the divine that is perfecting itself. And within the real, we have our ideals, our thoughts, our, our mind. And we saw how evolution slowly <coughs> gave rise to mind. But along with mind... The major trend that we identified was that for greater care, greater care for others, greater uh, empathy, greater ability to perceive an other. So uh, this is the core of evolution, uh, the core thrust of evolution, the golden rule, love thy neighbor as thyself. Uh, that is the core thrust of evolution. As we saw, as it began, began with predation, procreation, parenting, and finally sociability, uh, differentiation of roles, um, so that uh, we care for others. Uh, and height will illuminate for us the various biological substrata of this, and in fact uh, will point out our next step, where we should take our next step, or more to the point, uh, where the boundary between evolutionary um, um, antecedents, the, 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 the playing field that we begin, uh, lies with our uh, ideal, with our destiny, with what we uh, perceive about reality, our conjectures about reality, uh, from which we will um, derive our uh, plan of action, because every person uh, has a plan of action in life, which includes many things, and is, is a conglomeration of aspirations, uh, desires, thoughts, ideals, uh, constraints, and so on. And uh, what we want to point out here is how uh, we the biology... Um, uh, pre-wires our choices and delineate the place where modernity is uprooting that biology 
and it is uprooting it in exactly the same direction that we have seen in evolution. So, in fact, as we get deeper into height and we understand the pre-wiring of our moral uh, foundations, moral in the sense of uh, this is the socially accepted good or the socially accepted right or the socially accepted just and so on, the, the moral fabric of our society, we will see how modernity uh, deviates from biology uh, and creates and sets up a new destiny uh, in which we have a far greater uh, impact on our um, morality, if we choose, uh, for good or for bad. Uh, as we saw uh, so many examples, and we'll get more into that later. Uh, in any case, we are continuing now with the basis of morality according to uh, height. And just to recap, uh, let's have a look at um, what he um, uh, showed us before. We just uh, recap that. So as we saw last time, uh, height has six bases for uh um, morality as it developed in evolution and uh, um, he is going to uh, describe the way that each one has evolved. So we have sanctity, degradation, authority, subversion, loyalty, betrayal, fairness, cheating, liberty, oppression, and care, harm. In fact, uh, for us the most salient part is the care, harm um, basis um, because that is what we see in the progression of evolution. And in a way, uh, the rest uh, are subservient or a buttress, are used to buttress the care harm, uh, which focuses first and foremost on the offspring. This is the parenting. This, this is what grew from parenting. But now, uh, if we continue the thrust of evolution, then uh, the care harm uh, spreads out, as we said in the golden rule, to encompass uh, other people who are not our offspring or siblings or so on, but the greater whole. And um, all the other, um, all the other bases that Hyde points to uh, are part of our interactions with uh, these others. Um, and uh, we will see how in modernity, um, and Hyde shows this very well, uh, he calls it the weird, as we saw before, the weird culture, because it's so new, it's different than everything that happened uh, uh, um, throughout history, throughout evolution, this is new, everything that's happening today is new, and um, he finds it uh, somewhat problematic, he wants a better balance between uh, the evolutionary basis of our morality, in other words, he wants a little bit to make uh, biology into destiny. Uh, actually, we are also uh, uh, talking about the biological destiny of uh, the rise of care for others. But, <laughs> but uh, in a way, he's saying, uh, look, don't go too far. Let's go back to where we were uh, as human beings. So, in fact, he's going to illuminate for us um, what we are, evolutionary, uh, Lee, as human beings, um, from a moral point of view, how we developed morality or what kind of morality we developed. So um, let's start looking at, uh, at some of his, his insights here and see uh, what he's talking about. Okay, so uh, here he's talking about the Loyalty Betrayal Foundation. This is on page 91. And he says, uh, many psychological systems contribute to effective tribalism in s and success in intergroup competition. That's like the, the, the evolutionary basis of our cohesion. He says, the loyalty betrayal foundation is just a part of our innate preparation for meeting the adapted challenge of forming cohesive coalitions. The original trigger for the loyalty foundation is anything that tells you who is a team player and who is a traitor particularly when your team is fighting with other teams. But because we love tribalism so much, we seek out ways to form groups and teams that can compete just for the fun of competing. 
Much of the psychology of sports is about expanding the current triggers of the loyalty foundation so that people can have the pleasures of binding themselves together to pursue harmless trophies. Uh, okay, so trophies, okay, never mind the trophies thing. Uh, so what he's, what's he saying here actually uh, is, um, is that we have an innate drive to bind together. This evolutionarily, it's like um, uh, expanding the self to include the group in what is uh, considered to be the I, instead of the, the personal I, as we saw in previous uh, stages of evolution of predation, the I that is the other, or procreation, the I that procreates with another, and uh, maybe the, even the, the parenting I, the I that cares for the offspring, now we have an, an expanded I, the group I, that if you are part of it, you are, um, uh, you are loyal to that part of the group, and if you're outside, you are the enemy. This is, this is the essence of, of uh, essentialism, actually. Uh, do you belong? Are you an I? Are you part of the uh, group for we, uh, and, and others within that group? Uh, you can say to them, love thy neighbor as thyself. These are my neighbors. Or are you outside the group? You are an enemy and then not worthy of love. And essentially, this is the core um, basis that, um, that creates uh, hate, strife, war, etc. Uh, our group versus the other group, racism, our race versus another race, our nation versus another nation. So this, uh, um, this cohesion is very important uh, as an evolutionary step in protecting uh, the group, the young, it's like an expanded eye. The, 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 the ability for us to identify with a group as an expanded eye. But the problem here is, what's the size of that eye? It's tribal, okay, so the boundaries of the tribe. Is it national, the boundaries of the nation? Is it pan-human? Is all of humanity, say there was an alien race uh, or an alien beings coming, so it would be humanity, the I would be humanity versus the other, the alien. So, in fact, this, the, the loyalty betrayal basis is something that is um, at the very root of what modernity is going against because modernity is undermining that uh, us and them mentality all the time in everything it does. And we'll go uh, more into that in later videos, but basically it's like academia, science, uh, people everywhere um, are collaborating regardless of race, creed, nation, etc., religion, on uh, issues of science, uh, money is one way that people communicate uh, across all borders, and um, we'll, we'll have a lot to say about that later. But basically, modernity itself, the internet, the, the fact that everyone is interconnected and everyone has a say, for the meantime, uh, um, this is very fragile if we will not protect the, the egalitarianism of the internet, um, it's, it's pretty fragile. You can see the way that Google changes its algorithms all the time. Uh, you get search results that are very different from what you got like a decade ago, uh, much more constrained, much more what Google wants you to see and less what's out there. You have to be a lot more sophisticated to see what's really out there. Uh, databases uh, how, are removed from um, direct access and so on. But in any case, um, modernity is undermining, uh, in many ways, this tribalism. So, so this is, uh, uh, Haidt shows us that this is an evolutionary thing. This tribalism was very uh, beneficial to us uh, from an evolutionary point of view because it helped us uh, function as a group, as one cohesive whole, as team players. And this is still important in many endeavors but it's very dangerous as well, as we uh, saw in the great um, uh, cohesions 
or under uh, the flags of various ideals, uh, this group thing or group think uh, is very dangerous to morality uh, or to care for others because uh, it, it makes it legitimate to crush the other side, to crush the other party. Uh, it legitimizes it. So in communism, it legitimized uh, persecuting, for example, uh, um, people who were, um, you know, like uh, small uh, bourgeoisie, as it were. It was to prosecute the bourgeoisie and people who were murdered, killed by the millions uh, uh, in this context of uh, stamping out uh, private ownership. So it was like an us them. Are you a good communist? You are us, or are you them? And then it expanded with uh, uh, Stalin's famous paranoia, and millions and millions, uh, tens of millions of people died over this distinction. Uh, in the Nazi era, of course, it's the Aryan race and all the other thems that may be exterminated, should be exterminated, especially the Jews. Uh, they were considered. Uh, uh, something that, that has to be stamped out methodically, but and this was part of being us or them. It was a very tribal mentality. And you find it everywhere. So it could be benign, and it's very important for like, uh, you know, like um, um, companies working together, organizations, or any group of people who want to do something together. They need a group ethos. They need an us and them. But this us and them is always very important. Uh, very dangerous because it, it can lead to hate and so on. So this is one part of biology uh, that, that destiny has to uproot. Uh, we are, in fact, uh, if we go back to our ideal conjectures and real refutations, so uh, if we have ideals that uh, are under-wired under, under uh, or pre-wired uh, to us and them, then these ideals are in fact incorporating not something that is uh, completely free in that we arrived in it through refuting what is bad for us and adopting what is good for us, but it is something pre-wired that infiltrates into our ideologies and, um, and then we color and, and um, Haidt will speak of this at great length, uh, that we color uh, our uh, innate tendencies with a patina of ideology. He calls it, Haidt calls it the elephant and the rider. We are like 97% elephant, that's the evolutionary uh, drives, and 3% rider justifying uh, what we're doing as an ideal. So, in fact... Uh, if there was, but I think this is this is um, this is um, uh, not a, a completely um, full description of what really happens here. Because let's take communism for example. So uh, communism originated in an analysis uh, of uh, Marx analysis of how reality operates. He had th this conjecture about this and that, and this conjecture was ultimately refuted by reality, of course. But uh, in the next stage, the uh, substratum, the, the pre-wiring of um, tribalism overcame or, or um, inhabited the ideals, the ideas of Marxism, and it became us against them. We, the good communists, and they, the nasty capitalists, and so on. This also happened in the West, in the McCarthy area. We, the good ones, and the red, the, the red danger, and so on. So, and and of course, there's always things in reality that you can hinge this on. But as we we see this uh, ev uh, from a point of view of evolution, then this is like um, a biological um, um, weight that's dragging us down, dragging dragging the ideal down, so that uh, ultimately uh, they become. Uh, like uh, the patina on something much more fundamental, much more uh, primordial, the primordial drives of tribalism that are now uh, conceived of as uh, the working, the proletarian ver versus the bourgeoisie or so on, or the Aryan race versus the Jewish race and so on. Uh, 
ultimately, the actual progress of evolution, the real refutes it. And what really refuted these regimes? Ultimately, it was human misery. Human misery is always the trump card because, as we said, the care, the care foundation of evolution is what is, this is the trend, this is the, the golden thread that we see working out throughout uh, evolutionary progress. And this always arouses us to see where we have gone wrong. So nobody managed to refute Marxism. There are still Marxists around. There's still communists around. There are still people who believe that, that Stalin was the, the son of the nations and so on. That wasn't what undercut communism. It's not, it wasn't on, a, on an ideal basis. It was the real. It was the fact that it had so many, uh, made so many people mis miserable and, and caused so many death that ultimately refuted <clears throat> that thinking. Because everything we believe is a conjecture, ultimately. And conjectures may be uh, quite transparent ones, as in science, where we have this conjecture, then we have an experiment that refutes or corroborates. Of course, it can only refute. Corroboration is only temporary, as Popper showed. But also, in reality, <clears throat> everything we do, we have a religious belief, we have uh, an ideological belief. Will reality... Uh, uh, prove it or disprove it? Will it lead to human misery or human happiness? So ultimately, the pursuit of happiness becomes a true criteria. Does this, this pursuit of happiness, this ability to uh, uh, allow each person to realize uh, his or her uh, God-given potential, is it fostered by this ideology or is it damp dampened down? Does this ideology uh, bring about atrocious atrocities or does it breed, uh, does it foster creativity and, and human growth and, and uh, uh, realization of potential? So this is the balance all the time. So uh, when, when um, Haidt speaks about the loyalty betrayal foundation as an evolutionary trait, we can see very well how it worked throughout history and how at the moment it could be very counterproductive for us. So it's a very fine line here. To what extent are we, do we band together as one? And to what extent uh, we are going with John Lennon, imagine there's no country and no religion too, uh, meaning imagine that people will not uh, be uh, killing each other because they are outside our group, uh, which is problematic because we like to be in groups. This is part of our um, part of our heritage. It's like we eat. This is why do we eat? Because this is how we evolved, and tribalism is part of how we evolved. So as we said again and again, uh, since biology is not destiny. Now we have to shape our de destiny, but be cognizant of what our biology shows us. Okay, so let's now go back to uh, height. Okay, so back to uh, height. Um, tribalism also involves our ability to uh, put ourselves last, f put the group first. Uh, when, when a person... Uh, goes into an army of for one's nation, tribe, or whatever, then uh, that person is willing to give his or her life for uh, the group. Where did this come from? Uh, if we go by Dawkins with the selfish gene, you're not getting anywhere because uh, the selfish gene must be selfish. In fact, Dawkins is a classic um, example of how uh, the conjecture becomes dogma, and that dogma, he sort of... Um, uh, he forces reality to fit his dogma uh, of uh, of selfishness, which is, in fact, a moral standpoint. It's it's trying to say evolution is selfish. Why? It's just like you know, red in tooth and claw. It's the same old uh, Spencerian uh, might makes right uh, kind of conclusion that is absolutely wrong when you look at evolution itself, because evolution is the evolution of care, of giving yourself to others of, of 
uh, putting yourself a second. And uh, Dawkins uh, attempted to to put it back, the selfish gene. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, do genes have morality? Of course not. So, uh, But still, genes evolve morality. Genes, and before that, molecules, we saw how everything develops from the Big Bang, and it's all one holistic universe uh, that constantly progresses uh, as part of divinity, uh, the divine universe. So, in fact, he was absolutely wrong about the selfishness, because even though uh, things act in a random uh, way, uh, the ultimate upshot is that life evolves. Despite randomness, despite entropy, we have a completely different direction in the thrust of evolution. So uh, when we have this tribalism, which is good for uh, the expansion, it comes from the expansion of the parenting, um, the parenting phenomenon, then uh, a person, just as a parent, would uh, give its life uh, for an offspring, so uh, a, par a person within the group, within the tribe, is now becomes now self-sacrificial because he, his or her eye has expanded to the dimensions of the group now. The group is the eye, is the expanded eye, the greater eye. So uh, let's read a bit of uh, height now. So he's saying like this. Uh, a gene for suicidal self-sacrifice would be favored by group-level selection. It would help the team win. But it would be so strongly opposed by selection at the individual level that such a trait could evolve only in a species such as bees, where competition within the hive has been nearly eliminated, uh, and almost all selection is group selection. Uh, so you see, evolution is always working to find the way for this, uh, the bees, uh, in fact, the insects, the social insects, were one, um, one evolving path of evolution that was potentially leading to greater awareness, greater care of the other. But somewhere along the line, it, it didn't pan out, and, uh, or, or the birds didn't pan out, and ultimately it was from the mammals that uh, we sprung. But... The, the pressure to care for the other is there. And the self-sacrifice is part of that. And uh, bees and ants and termites, I'm, go I'm going back to height now, bees and ants and termites are the ultimate team players. One for all, all for one, all the time. Even if that means dying to protect the hive from invaders. So it's like, it's like overkill. They lost the individual. Humans can be turned into suicide bombers, but it takes a great deal of training, pressure, and psychological manipulation. It doesn't come naturally to us. I think, I think um, height here is wrong. I think uh, humans uh, can, can, are always ready to give their lives to the highest ideals. Uh, it comes from parenting. It's, it's a simple evolutionary progress uh, that you say, um, I'm, I'm willing to give my life for my child. And that's, that's the, the basis bio, basic biological drive there. So, of course, as we said, biology is not destiny. A human being can be a very bad parent and not give his life for his offspring and, and so on. But the, the psychological evolutionary drive is there. Now, when it comes to group, since the group is an expanded eye, then uh, human beings are always ready to uh, sacrifice their lives for the greater ideal. Uh, if it's in religion, they become martyrs. Uh, if it's in nationhood, they become uh, heroes. And, uh, and also, this can be uh, subverted into suicide bombing, because what do suicide bombers think? They think that they are uh, fighting for truth, uh, liberty, the ideal, whatever. They have all this in their minds. And it doesn't take a great deal of training pressure and psychological manipulation, it, it, or not more than any religion. So although uh, we want to distinguish uh, suicide bombing and say this is bad, the way to do it is not to make it into an essentialist thing, but rather to see 
how this is part of our human ability to put ourselves uh, as second fiddles, to put ourselves in a place that we are willing to die for what we believe in. Every person who fights for his country, all those soldiers who died uh, defending their country throughout history, uh, are they not uh, martyrs? Are they not, uh, they're not suicide bombers, but they, they are willing to die for their ideal. So uh, suicide bombing is, uh, aside, instead of uh, uh, turning it into a sort of essentialist struggle between uh, the good guys, the West maybe, and the bad guys, maybe Islam, they, they make suicide bombers or the Khmer Rouge or whatever, uh, we should see that this is a human traits and we should see the underpinning of evolution there because this is what faces us if we want a society without suicide bombers, a society where uh, of less violence and more care for the individual, then we have to know where we're coming from. And ultimately, we are capable as humans of giving our lives for the group. So going back to, um, to uh, Haidt, he says, once human groups had some minimal ability to band together and compete with other groups, then group level selection came into play and the most groupish groups had an advantage over groups of selfish individualists. But how did early humans get those groupish abilities in the first place? Uh, Darwin proposed a series of pro probable steps by which humans evolved to the point where they could be uh, groups of team player players in the first place. So um, let's see uh, some of this. What, what about human beings as compared to, say, bees or insects? Since ancient times, people have likened human societies to beehives. But this, is, uh, but this is just a loose analogy. If you map the queen of the hive onto the queen or king of a city-state, then yes, it's loose. A hive or colony has no ruler, no boss. The queen is just the ovary. But if we simply ask whether humans went through the same evolutionary process as bees, a major transition from self selfish individualism to groupish hives that prosper when they find a way to suppress free riding then the analogy gets much tighter. Many animals are social. They live in groups, flocks, or herds, but only a few animals have crossed the threshold and become totally uh, um, social. Or what's he say here? I don't know. Become, and become completely social, which, which means they live in a very large groups that have some internal structure enabling them to reap the benefits of the division of labor. Beehives and ant nests and their se separate castes of soldiers, scouts, and nursery attendants are examples of ultra-sociality. -social and so are human societies. One of the key features that has helped all the non-human ultra-socials to cross over appears to be the need to defend a shared nest. The biologist Bert uh, Paul Dobler and E. O. Wilson summarized the recent findings that uh, ultra-sociality, which they call EU sociality, is found among a few species of shrimp, aphids, thrips, and beetles, as well as among wasps, bees, ants, and termites. In all the known species that display the earliest stages of EO sociality, their behavior protects a persistent defensible resource from predators, parasites, or competitors. The resource is invariably a nest plus dependable food within foraging range of the nest inhabitants. So this is trying to sort of limit the data. You can just see the reductionist <laughs> scientists at work here. They don't know how to handle this. So say, okay, let's look uh, for the benefit here. Where is the selfish gene here. But as we saw, th this isn't really uh, the way that it works. Although ultimately, of course, there will be uh, a place that you protect and so on if this provides you with uh, what you need for your sustenance. But here we get to the point because uh, I'm reading again from, uh, from Haidt. Uh, and he quotes Hall, Dobler, and Wilson that give supporting role to two other factors. The need to feed offspring over an extended period. Again, the rise of sociability from the evolution of parenting. 
and this gives an advantage to species that can recruit siblings or males to help out mum. So again, uh, we see how from the mammalian world of, uh, um, of uh, uh, parenting, there grew the sociability of the mammals, the need uh, for everyone to enlist in parenting and therefore cooperate among themselves and therefore treat each other as um, equals or as peers and therefore uh, the tribalism and it all uh, it's all a direct continuation of the of the um, of what we saw about parenting and what we saw about the way that evolution develops uh, in general so uh, uh, this is uh, this applied to early wasps and so on uh, and then uh, the honeybees so here I think I think uh, this is a bit beside the point here um, uh, this idea that we have to have the defendable territory I think this this happens there uh, it's true it appears in reality but it's not the central issue here the central issue here is the ability of individuals to subsume themselves in a greater group. So let's get to humans now. So Haidt says, uh, like bees, our ancestors were one territorial creature with a fondness for defensible nests, such as caves. I'm not so sure. Uh, there are other visions of uh, evolution, not just in caves. Uh, we lived there, uh, there's like the uh, Alien Morgans, uh, the aquatic ape that we lived in lo literal uh, um, uh, ecosystems along the shore, or the, all the idea of, of uh, that we uh, were lived in trees at some point or in savannas. It's not all caves. This is speculation. But two gave birth to needy offspring that required enormous amounts of care, which had to be given while the group was under threat from neighboring groups. So this is true. So we had an expanded eye, an expanded per parent, as it were, in the tribe. And this tribe was all the time uh, battling with other groups, under tribes, other tribes, as well as the general uh, environment. So for hundreds of thousands of years, conditions were in place that pulled for evolution of ultra sociability or sociality. And as a result, we are the only ultra social primate. The human lineage may have started off acting very much like chimps, but by the time our ancestors started walking out of Africa, they had become at least a little bit like bees, one for all and all for one, actually one for all, not all for one. Uh, all for the offspring or all for all, but not all for one, but just one for all. Um, and then Haidt adds, and much later, when some groups began planting crops and orchards and they're building granaries, storage sheds, fenced pastures and permanent homes, they had an even steadier food supply that had to be defended even more vigorously. Like bees, humans began building ever more elaborate nests, and in just a few thousand years, a new kind of vehicle appeared on Earth, the city-state, able to raise walls and armies. City-states and later empires spread rapidly across Eurasia, North Africa, and Mesoamerica, changing many of Earth's ecosystems and allowing the total tonnage of human beings to shoot up from insignificance at the start of the Holocene, around 12,000 years ago, to world domination today. As the colonial insects did to other insects, we have pushed all other mammals to the margins, to extinction or to servitude. The analogy to bees is not shallow or loose. Despite their many differences, human civilizations and beehives are both products of major transitions uh, in evolutionary history. Um, okay, so he, he uh, Hyde encapsulates here a lot of uh, stuff in one uh, a very long paragraph, um, but in fact, uh, the important thing is uh, that ultimately humans uh, learn to cooperate and to uh, sacrifice themselves uh, to uh, the greater whole, um, and um, and this sacrifice uh, came about uh, ultimately through perception of that whole as 
an extension of the eye. So how is this? What, where does this extension of the eye, how can we perceive uh, a greater eye? How can we identify with the group to the extent that we place ourselves uh, in a secondary position? And in this, human beings uh, beyond, or, or um, not beyond, contrary to all other creatures on earth uh, are capable of living by their ideals, by their conjectures. Our ideas about who we are, what we are, what reality is, dictate for us how we will behave and how we perceive ourselves. It is like we are pre-wired to extend be beyond our pre-wiring. Now, we saw how this developed ultimately from uh, extended parenting as the tribe, the group, uh, uh, became an extended parent for its offsprings. So, but in this extension, uh, the individual became more greatly detached from the hardwired strata of evolution, of predation, of, uh, of um, procreation. They are still there, but they now take secondary, st uh, secondary um, uh, roles to... Uh, our ability to expand into our ideal, into our visions of reality, how we perceive the group, ourselves, and, and, and etc., and identify the I with the group. Um, this may be akin to, to uh, bees and ants in the final, uh, that finally there is a functioning society, but the path is very different. Uh, the social insects, they, they lead into a kind of kill the sack because the individual is completely subsumed in the group. But in human beings, um, a function, a mechanism developed that uh, made it possible for the individual to switch uh, affiliation with the group on and off. Every individual is capable of self-sacrifice when needed, but it's not always necessary. And the mechanism that allows this freedom of individuality and group or individual within a group goes through the mind, through our ability to perceive reality and shape it as dogma, as a doctrine of how we should behave, our reality is constructed, our ideas about this world and the next, the life and afterlife, uh, physics and metaphysics, everything is this human ability to actually uh, create an imagined reality, which is a conjecture about the real all the time. The real is there because evolution is, is all, we are living in the real, living within an evolutionary world. But now the progress hinges on our minds, on our ability to perceive and conceive of reality. This allows the individual to say to himself, the group is more important. I shall give my life to the group, or I shall give my life to God, or I shall give my life uh, to save the nation, uh, or uh, against the enemy, I will uh, die, um, but I will kill many enemies. You know, uh, the ultimate uh, terrorist, Samson, pushing... Uh, single-handedly the pillars of the uh, Philistine temple and destroying so many along with him. So, uh, not that I'm saying that Samson was a terrorist, although he had some some elements, you know, like he took this, uh, the, the cheek of a donkey, the, the jawbone of a donkey, and he uh, smote so many with with a donkey. So he's the ultimate hero who uh, sacrifices himself for uh, the good of the uh, group. In this case, the uh, against the enemies of uh, the people of Israel and so on. But where where does where is this? Where is it coming from? It's coming from a place that is capable of um, putting aside the ego. And only the ego or the, the individual 
Only the ideal, only the mind can do that. The mind is able to uproot the, uh, the pre-wiring of older strata of evolution, the, the, the egoism of predation, procreation, even parenting in a minimum way, in, the, in, the minimal, uh, in its minimal sense, which does not view the others. But once the eye becomes expanded and becomes a social eye, then the individual is capable of um, sacrificing himself. But unlike bees, it, still, it goes through uh, perception, through ideation, through imagining an ideal, imagining uh, some kind of whole that the individual is part of. And when uh, the individual sacrifices himself, it's, it's like... Um, for a greater good, as it were. And this is all in the mind. So this is a human innovation. So our tribalism is coupled uh, with our ability to actually uh, delineate the tribe, to actually establish these distinctions, these uh, essentialist distinctions, and say, this is the essence of me in this group, and this is not me in another group which is, uh, as we saw throughout history, this is fluid. Because it goes through the mind, there's also here uh, the, the ability to outgrow this. The, the tribe expands into a nation, it's greater, the, it's, a, it's a larger uh, tribe, and now you don't know everyone there. It's, it's all in your mind. You imagine the imagined communities that Anderson speaks about. So this is, uh, becomes part of our evolutionary heritage disability and it coincides ultimately it will uh, in our times uh, start bearing fruit in our ability to really uh, walk away from so much of our biology and shape uh, a new uh, destiny okay let's uh, let's read some more uh, in height so uh, here uh, height begins t touching on this um, uh, understanding that the mind of humans uh, creates uh, a new step in, in evolution, constitutes a new step, uh, something new appears in the world, the ability of one mind to conceive of itself and of other minds and uh, thus uh, become part of a group. So I'm reading now from Height a little bit. In contrast, uh, where when early humans began to share intentions, their ability to hunt, gather, raise children and raid their neighbors increased exponentially. Everyone on the team now had a mental representation of the task, knew that his or her partners shared the same representation, knew when a partner had acted in a way that impeded success or that hogged the spoils and reacted negatively to these violations. When everyone in a group began to share a common understanding of how things were supposed to be done and then felt a flush, flash of negativity when any individual violated these expectations, the first moral matrix was born. Remember that a matrix is a consensual hallucination. That, I believe, was our Rubicon crossing. So, in fact, uh, this is the, the leap in evolution. Uh, it's a leap in mind. It's a leap in our ability to actually shape our conjectures about ourselves, our others. These mental representations uh, are what allows us to flexibly um, coordinate with others. But this is still hardwired with hardwired, uh, pre-wired with other things, with other evolutionary um, trends, and pulls us. Uh, in particular, in the, in the direction of dogma, because only when we have the same representation that everyone agrees on the vision of reality, that this is how things are, only then can cooperation be achieved uh, at its peak. If someone has a divergent opinion, is uh, out of consensus, uh, is dissenting, then he disrupts the group harmony, he disrupts uh, our ability to act as a group. So, in fact, uh, at the same time as we have this ability to imagine a world that uh, uh, is common with others, this 
this intersubjectivity that we and others share a shared vision of the world, uh, this comes along with a baggage of um, uh, being a very uh, firm, a crusty sort of thing that is difficult to shake and change. We are looking for confirmation rather than uh, um, disconfirmation, rather than refutation. So, and this is part of being uh, capable of acting in a group. Let's read some more uh, from Haidt. He now uh, refers to Tomasello. Uh, who believes that human ultra-sociality arose in two steps. The first was the ability to share intentions in groups of two or three people who are actively hunting or foraging together. That was the Rubicon. I'm not sure that it arose there. It could be like three mothers deciding on how to uh, share care of a child. Why, why should it be just hunting? Uh, okay, foraging, maybe, I don't know, it's speculation. And anyway, we know it arose. Then, after several hundred thousand years of evolution of better sharing and collaboration as nomadic hunter-gatherers, more collaborating groups began to get larger, perhaps in response to the threat of other groups. Victory went to the most cohesive groups, the ones that could scale up their ability to share intentions from three people to 300 to 3,000 people. This was the second step. Natural selection favored increasing levels of what Tomasello called group-mindedness. The ability to conform, learn and conform to social norms. Here we go. The ideal, the conjectures, the theory, the meta-theory of a group. Feel and share group-related emotions and ultimately to create and obey social institutions, including religion. A new set of selection pressures operated within groups. Non-conformists were punished or at least, uh, very least, were less likely to be chosen partners for joint ventures, as well as between groups, cohesive groups took territory and other resources from less cohesive groups. So uh, shared intentionality uh, is the way that uh, groups uh, be became uh, capable of cooperating. But what does it mean by shared intentionality? It means that we uh, have a mind capable of perceiving uh, what other people think. And the way that we perceive what other people think is that we think alike, that we have the same intentions, the same ideas, the same worldview, and so on. This breeds dogma. So dogma uh, becomes part of our um, of our uh, evolutionary baggage, as it were, our, our biological substratum, uh, and it is always striving against our ability to become more liberated, uh, more free in our uh, perception of the world uh, to such an extent uh, that we are capable of uh, generating a new way, a new way of doing things that differs from accepted dogma. But uh, this shared intentionality is a, an agreement. I'm reading now from, uh, uh, from um, Haidt again. is an agreement among people who share a joint representation of the things in their world and who share a set of conventions for communicating with, with each other about these things. So that's the, the core of this. It's not the intentionality. Of course we can share intentionalities. But the important thing is the agreement, the consensus on joint representation of things, of ideas. It's a community sharing the idea that this is our God, this is our, this is our reality, this is our nation. And the individual in, incorporates within his mind this vision that is shared with others. And that's, that goes for language. Language is the basis of this. Because... Uh, What's the meaning of a word? Our community, our shared language community tells us what the meaning is. And we as individuals share, we believe in the meaning of that word. When I say a word, then uh, that word uh, is perceptible to other speakers of my language. And I know and they know that we are speaking about the same thing. How can this be? This is all representations of the mind. So it's all got to do with dogma. And dogma and doctrine are embedded in language. There's uh, some postmodernist 
th uh, thinkers who speak about the prison house of language because we are trapped in the concepts that we uh, receive, uh, that we share with others. It's true, but how else would you conceive? Uh, so it's like the prison house of life. We live. We are constrained within bodies. It's it's this, it's along the same uh, um, religious um, dichotomies of body and spirit and so on. But anyway, I'm not going to the, now the theology of postmodernist uh, construction of language. That's uh, maybe in another lecture. But at the moment, the important thing is that we. Uh, have a conjecture, a theory, an ideal about reality, about uh, uh, society, about ourselves, and, and our very language, our very humanness is embedded within a matrix of shared uh, subjectivity, of intersubjectivity, of joint representation. We all believe the same thing. We all have the same vision of reality, the same dogma, the same conjecture, the same ideal. So uh, this becomes part of what we are as humans. So when we get to the turn um, to the real, uh, the rise of science, where dogma uh, shifted from authority to a wider, from from uh, from one authority to another, because science also has authority. It's, it's a group authority. So in a way, uh, our turn to the real has also uh, been a part of our evolution. It, it resonates with one part of our evolution that allows an egalitarian group of individuals to um, establish their own worldview. Now, this is very... Uh, it's... It's very um, fragile because when you have a shared worldview, this is beneficial for you as a, as a group. But it also uh, petrifies you. It also freezes you in one position. It becomes dogma. So op being open to the world, to the real, uh, to refutations is very good for flexibility. But very bad for uh, tradition, for stability, and so on. So it's like something in there. We have this ability uh, and, and this ability uh, to look at the real and to make conjectures has uh, allowed us to progress throughout history. But we also have the comparable ability to share representations and that sharing becomes enshrined. It's, it becomes um, uh, solidified very strongly. Dogma is in many ways an extension of language. You don't argue about the meaning of words. When you say, for, when, for example, I say uh, uh, wood. I mean wood. I, I'm reading here uh, from the screen. Wood, fire, or be. What do I mean by be? With a double E, everyone understands I'm talking about this uh, flying insect that makes honey. Everyone who speaks English. But So we're not going to argue now about the meaning of be because all the people... Uh, who know English share this uh, understanding. Of course, they may be confused with B with just a BE, so they need some a lot of training. There's a lot of uh, um, a lot of uh, learning until you get to um, distinguish between B uh, B insect and B to be uh, the verb, uh, the central verb of our essence. But the important thing is, there's no arguing. It's part of our consensus. Consensuality lies at the very root of our ability to function in a group. So dissension becomes uh, something that is uh, something of the enemy, as it were. Uh, the speaker of a foreign language, the alien who doesn't understand, doesn't share our ability to represent our cosmos together. So in a way, dogma um, the, the, the solidification of ideas in such a way that uh, becomes rigid and, and resistive to changes in reality is part of our humanity, of our developing humanity um, as, um, as we evolve. Uh, let me go back, let me turn this off because we're... Um, okay, uh, Okay, so 
So ultimately, if we go back here to our um, ideal and the real, um, we see that the, uh, the ability to create an ideal, to conjecture uh, an image of reality, to represent both ourselves and uh, reality uh, to ourselves and to others, and the consensus that we are capable of achieving, this uh, uh, is the very core of our evolutionary innovation as human beings. And this uh, is all the time um, um, uh, in conflict, uh, in the conflict and the, um, not always conflict, but also in, in harmony, let's say it's in the interaction with the real. Does our dogma fit the real or not? Uh, um, we see an insect, is it a bee? Does it fit into our preconceived representation of the bee? No, this is another insect, we don't know what it is. So can we ask uh, someone who specializes in insects what it is? Or will we give it another name? Or we'll just call it insect? Uh, the real has just met our preconception. And all our ideals and theories and religions um, are part of our human heritage, the ability to create a worldview shared by everyone else around us. So this is at the very core, at the very root of both traditions and dogmas, but also the rise of science, because this ability to achieve consensus and to believe in the consensus of a group, to believe that the, the, <coughs> that when many people see the same thing, think the same thing, this is the truth, <coughs> this is real, this allowed us to develop our scientific worldview that hinges on consensus. Because how do we know, how do we accept a certain scientific theory? Because all scientists agree on it. Then it becomes real, or, or then it becomes the ideal, the theory, the dogma that we adopt. But it's still open to the refutations of the real, of, of reality. And that's why everything is changing so fast in our generation, uh, in our era, <coughs> because we switched. We switched our uh, ability of representation uh, from something more rigid that would latch on to the representation of the group and not shift uh, uh, and, and struggle against any shift uh, as something that would weaken our group identification into a world where it becomes more fluid and the consensus of the group uh, actually creates our reality for us uh, in a way that is more fluid. And we see this in science, we see this uh, in economics, and we see this in the development of laws, um, and also on a grander scale in religion. But religion takes a longer time to change. It changes, but it's, it takes a longer time. Religion is much more uh, deeply affiliated with our evolutionary heritage, and we will see uh, with the biological aspects of our evolution. And this is the main point made by Haidt, in fact, and why we are uh, discussing him at such length, <coughs> to see how uh, traditional human societies, traditions, are often... Uh, more in keeping with uh, uh, a certain uh, level of biological evolution that we are now capable of outgrowing. So, uh, in fact, we are looking at what our biology is uh, pre-wiring us to do, and we are attempting to uh, delineate a new ideal, a new vision that would allow us to shape our own destiny in a way that does not have to coincide with all the various points of uh, our evolutionary progress that were necessary at a, a previous stage of our evolution, but now become redundant uh, since we are capable of generating a, a new representation of reality that would allow us to evolve more deeply in the general thrust of what Haidt calls the care uh, uh, versus harm foundation. The care for others, the care uh, for other human beings and letting them uh, continue to manifest their potential 
as we continue to be able to function together as a group, but less dogmatically. Because now, as science has shown, we are able of uh, letting refutations come in. Even though we have a confirmation bias, this is part of our heritage from an evolutionary point of view. We are now able to say, okay, we have this bias, but we're going against it because reality teaches us that this is good and this is good and so on. We don't have to go with our biases. We don't go, have to go with our pre-wiring. The pre-wiring is there, but we can take another tack. We can go another way. We can realize, as a parable, for example, that smoking is bad for our health and stop smoking. So we are pre-wired to enjoy smoking because it hits the proper receptors and so on. But our ideal, our vision of reality now teaches us that this could be very harmful for us. So we can overcome our uh, biological tendency and shape our own destiny. This is just, uh, just a parable for we can do this in so many ways, in so many um, directions now. So the important thing is that we as humans are capable uh, of representation, and that representation constitutes uh, the, uh, the, our idea of how we or the world should behave, our ideals, our dogmas, uh, and ultimately, if we are to be true to ourselves, our conjectures that are open to the refutations of the real while at the same time describing the real. So we can have some very good conjectures that are almost, that are our dogmas, our good representations. All of science is very good representations of reality. Uh, we have Einstein, we have Newton, that's very good conjectures. Even though they may be refuted, they have not been refuted. It's okay. Uh, we, we can use this to grapple with the real just as much as our ancestors used their shared dogmas to grapple with the real. And uh, this uh, basis of uh, sharing consensus, of getting a consensus of uh, those who are experts, of specialists in various areas, and that shapes our ideal, our vision of the real, this is also part of our evolutionary heritage in that um, dogma and uh, the, um, the power of authority uh, and, all, and, and, and other such bases of morality that we'll, we'll go into in the next uh, talk are actually, um, in a way, throwbacks to uh, an older evolutionary uh, stage uh, where the alpha male strutted around and said, I'm the one who determines what reality should be and what the representation should be and so on and so on. Uh, the dogmatic authority. So this is like an alpha male. But alpha males are throwbacks because as we shall see in the next talk, uh, part of human evolution was the development of an egalitarian group that suppressed bullies, that didn't let bullies um, do their work. So how did bullies arise? How do we have all these uh, authoritarian regimes, all these uh, uh, kingdoms uh, uh, where the king, uh, the sovereign, uh, uh, crushed uh, uh, with his uh, dictatorial power, uh, all others? Okay, that was part of representation, and it was, um, in a way, an, an echo of previous levels, because, as we said, everything in us uh, encapsulates what went before. So all these pre-wirings uh, may find an echo within civilization and develop for a certain time in a certain direction. But more about this, about egalitarianism, science, uh, and the alpha male in our next uh, talk.